and guests. I trust you've had a good Easter weekend and that you're still staying home, staying healthy and staying safe. My name is Arlene Lynn Volmink and I'm the president of the Isaka South Africa chapter. As communicated last week, if you feel concerned at this trying time, our virtual door is open. Please feel free to email our social and ethics committee at sec at isaka.org.za with any questions you might have. In the same breath, if you feel that you might have some extra time on your hands to volunteer for chapter activities, please reach out to us at info at isaka.org.za. We want to support you during this time and we need your support too. We are one. While many of us are still deliberating on the extended two-week lockdown and the personal challenges it may bring, we put our faith and support in the leadership of our country and we stand united in the global fight against the COVID-19 coronavirus. And while we support leadership in our country, we also ask you to do your part and vote for the leaders within our organization. Isaka International has recently introduced the new 2020 to 2021 Board of Directors. You might have seen this communication in the past few days. And locally, we are also encouraging you to vote for our next Board of Directors for the 2020 to 2022 term. Further details can be obtained on our webpage at engage.com slash South Africa chapter. As a chapter, we are doing our best to still bring value to our members and while we cannot network in person, we are using this opportunity to demonstrate our purpose in practice, which is to showcase the positive potential of technology. The recent launch of our online webinar series has been met with great and positive feedback from members and we hope that you enjoy what we have lined up for you in the next few months. Today, in our third chapter webinar series, I'm proud to introduce Francois Leroux. Francois has been an ISACA member since 1996 and he has held the position of treasurer since April 2017. He is a chartered accountant, a CISA, a Seagate and he holds an MCOM qualification as well. Having worked for PwC in its technology advisory practice for 20 years, Francois ran his own business for seven years until recently finally assuming a permanent position in retail. He has contributed to the chapter, to its strategy and initiatives with noteworthy contributions in terms of the investment strategy, our move to Pastel Online, the appointment of our finance manager, and to work that has kicked off to demonstrate a digitally aware chapter. Today you are in for a treat, as he will talk to you about the lessons he has learned over the many years in IT spending patterns. Francois, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is quite uh, quite new to me to do a, an online presentation. Um, first of all, um, welcome to everybody, and and, and I hope you'll enjoy uh, the presentation. Um, it is a it is an awareness presentation, um, uh, touching on some basics. Um, I'm hoping to to furnish uh, questions later on if you'd like to go into more. More detail, um, but in essence, the, the presentation um, is about whether I'm spending IT, um, whether I'm spending the right amount on IT, and whether I'm spending it in the right places. Um, and those are always difficult questions. Um, so there was there was a saying that said that um, you know, on a dark night, a man and his wife once lost their car keys. Um, the man actually kept looking for his keys under a lamppost. But after a while, his wife asked him, why is he only searching under the lamppost? And he replied that the light is better there. And that's, a, that's a, exactly how it is with um, IT financial reporting. So I've been doing IT financial reporting probably for the last about 10 years. And, and I've been doing it at um, major, major companies with billions of rands in IT spend. And actually the very first thing that you have to do before you can actually model the IT cost is you have to find it first. 
and that is actually 80% of the effort. Now you'll, you'll want to know why is it 80% of the effort, but I promise you it is 80% of the effort. Because you're dealing with issues like um, the financials are prepared in terms of an accountant's way of, of the world, and you have to actually translate those into IT services. And also, if you're dealing with very large groups with many uh, subsidiaries, and also you're dealing with complex um, chargeback models, um, the IT costs are all over the place. And it is actually um, what you need to do is to undo all of the apportionment of the of the IT costs to to subsidiaries. And if you're dealing with a retailer, for example, to stores um, or to divisions. So the very first point of call is typically your income statement. Um, there are there are other areas like um, you might need to go look at project accounting, um, and if you have sophisticated project accounting, that that helps. Um, you need to actually sometimes go right straight to the service provider invoices themselves. So if you're sitting, for example, with a very large um, network invoice from a company like say Dimension Data or Telcom. Um, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find that in the management accounts because it gets charged out to, to perhaps um, many hundreds of stores or divisions or so on. Um, so you, you actually have to work back to the invoice amount and capture that in your model. Um, if all else fails, then sometimes you have to also go back to um, analyst presentations. So if you're struggling to get a handle on, on capital spend, for example, um, that gets reported by the board to shareholders, and you can get information there. One of the one of the areas, um, and then lastly, one of the areas that's a concern is um, from perhaps a risk perspective, is the fact that shadow IT uh, spend happens. Now, it's it's uh, shadow IT. Uh, the estimates at the moment are around 30% to 40%, and even 50% of of actual IT spend would be in the business. Um, and that would mean that it's in the business's um, ledgers in the income statement. Um, so that's actually a, a, a challenge to, to, to get that, that, does, that spending. Uh, but it is, it is necessary. You must get the spending um, and then um, to add that to your model. So in fact, whatever model you have uh, before you can actually start analyzing, it must include the entire company and it must include um, all of the, the business IT spend as well. Um, you might also need to take out some spend from IT, uh, which is actually business, business spend, um, which is not appropriate, but it's, it's, it's a good exercise to, to be able to do this. So you define your data sources and you have to do this exercise on a monthly basis. Um, and then also just one last comment, it's very difficult um, to apportion costs to the right buckets. And, and hence what you probably need to do, and you'll see in the presentation, you need to apportion and make assumptions um, almost everywhere where you allocate costs to the right buckets and so on. So you'll see that um, if you are somebody who's got a lot of discomfort in terms of working with gray areas and estimates and so on, um, then this is probably not for you. Um, because you're going to be in a situation where you're 90% right, sometimes only 80% right, um, but at least that's better than nothing. So there's a lot of guesswork um, in terms of this um, to get uh, to get to a, a model. So if I can start with some of the basics, and I'm going to keep it quite um, quite uh, simple. Um, once you've got a model, and, and um, assuming, let's say, this company uh, in this model has spends about 100 million rands on IT, the very first way that you can actually look at your um, your uh, IT expenses is to, to, to bucket it in terms of operational expenses and then um, capital expenses. So operational expenses is that uh, that that's th those expenses that you use to run the business? Um, so it's software maintenance, your staff, your contractors, consulting, uh, facilities, network bandwidth, and so on. Capital expenses. Um, 
uh, small your 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 projects, your your data center costs, your application expenditure, end user computing, PCs, rollouts, and so on. So if you look, and I'm hoping you can see my mouse. If you look at this, the blue area is typically what the um, what the, is, is is a good benchmark. Um, in other words, it's uh, seventy percent, thirty percent, and and that's a good benchmark for actual IT spends. So if I go to the next slide, so once you once you done your analysis, you might be presented with um, something that looks like this. So if you look at the red area, the red area is a company um, with about 50 and 60 mil. Um, you have an, uh, a, a gray and then uh, a, a yellowish, um, a yellowish um, uh, spend, spending pattern. So if you look at that, and, and remember we're looking at a benchmark and, and you see operational expenses 50 million and 60 million in terms of uh, of your uh, of your capital expenses um the 50 million that seems seems a bit too low if i just look at it and then i sort of look and i see that the 60 million in terms of the capital expenses seems about double so it's likely that this um this company is has a large capex project running and it's actually consuming cash flow um, which is actually putting unwarranted pressure onto OPEX. So it's likely that what happened was um, that they're taking money from uh, from uh, from the, the OPEX budget and actually adding that to the CAPEX budget to actually fund the project. And maybe the project is in, under pressure. But it's not a good thing because you're putting um, your, your uh, operational budget under severe pressure. If we look at the other one, you can see the middle one, which is a gray, gray one, it looks okay. Um, they're spending more or less in line with uh, a good benchmark in terms of the operating expenses, but um, the capital expenses might be um, a, a bit high. And then, if you look at um, uh, if you look at your um, cash, your capital expenditure, maybe there's a good reason there. So there might have been a, a short-term spike. Maybe there's a rollout of some new technology or technology refresh, or maybe there's a big invoice that was um, just paid. Um, if you look at the yellow one, um, you can see there's a, uh, there's, th this company is showing a pattern where it's, it's underspending. It's, there's it's a definitely a concern there. So they spend not spending enough on OPEX and actually not spending enough on capital expenditure. So that's setting them up for a lot of trouble in in, in the future. So there's, there's, there's end of life risks in terms of technology, there's technical debt, and there's also um, an issue with there might be lack of relevance um, in the organization at large. Um, so definitely there's, there's serious underspend. Then if I, then if you go, what you can do, and it's important, um, on the previous slide, what you had, you had 100 million in spend, but that same spend, um, you can also apportion in another way, in other buckets. If you look at this, this, uh, this spending pattern, this one shows more in terms of hardware, software, personnel, and outsourcing. Um, so each one of those components would have a capital component, and each one of them would have a uh, OPEX component. Um, if you look at um, hardware, for example, you, you might have typically your, your purchases, lease, maintenance, depreciation, and that flows through. Okay. The typical spending pattern that you would want to look at is, um, is about 15%, 20%, 40%, and um, 25%. So once you've modeled your expenses, and remember, this would then also be a question of um, apportionment. So you have to decide um, if you have an expense, for example, a network invoice. Um, some of it might be even be for hardware. Some of it might be for software. Some of that part of that invoice might even be for personnel, consulting, um, and and some some other services. Um, so if I look at if I look at this uh, um, uh, if I look at this pattern. 
then you can see there's, a, um, there's definitely an underspin in terms of hardware, and then suddenly there's a big spike in terms of software, and there's a big spike in terms of personnel. And then in terms of outsourcing, we have 5 million, so that doesn't look good. There's some, some insights um, that we need to look at, and we'll look at it on the next slide. If we look at the, the Gray company, um, you can see there's a 10 mil, uh, 10 mil on software. There's something wrong here. You can see there's personnel, and there's also some outsourcing costs, but this company on, on is definitely underspending in terms of IT. So let, let's, let's assume, and I'm going to zoom in now on, on hardware, and, and this is basically part of the, the, the basic presentation. If you are underspending on, on hardware, the, the issues that you, you can deal, you can, you can see there is going to be an issue. Um, your hardware may become out of life cycle. You know that there are capacity issues. Um, the company might be, be in trouble. Um, uh, so what they're actually doing is they're deferring capital expenditure to somewhere else. Um, and that's also putting pressure. A valid, one valid reason that you might have for having a dip in your, in your hardware spin might be a move to the cloud. But you also can see that um, there is definitely um, uh, uh, some, some issues there. Um, but what, what will actually happen is um, the move to the cloud will, will actually add cost to the outsourcing component. So what do you what do you um, what do you do if you're overspending? Let's say you're sitting in a situation where you are overspending, and there's um, there's a lot of um, uh, overspending in terms of hardware. Um, there are actually good candidates. You need to look at issues like uh, economies of scale uh, that you can you can you can do you can look at um, you can sit and look at uh, shared IT services. Um, you probably need to look at procurement optimization. Um, a good good area to look at is actually to to look at your demand management processes. Um, so how do you manage your demand? How do you know uh, that people can actually buy what they want to buy if they ask you? Are they just um, doing that? Um, are they just asking, or are you actually then managing the demand? Some of the more f f f advanced uh, types of things that you can do is to buy or lease. Um, you can so you can actually sell your your assets and, and lease them back and then make actually make some some uh, money there. But it's obviously a, a cost benefit um, uh, issue there that you need to or, or that you need to prove. Um, all right. So we've looked at hardware. Now let's look at software. So in this situation, we see that the software spend is very high. We also see that the uh, um, uh, uh, we also see that the, the software spend on the great company is quite low. So let's look at the, the issues. If you're seeing a situation like in a great company where there's underspend, that's a very significant risk to the company. So it's a flashing red light um, because you're starting to ask a question, you know, why, why, why are we spending so little on software? It's a benchmark and we need to spend double. So a good reason might be that you, you use open source software. Open source software is always always nice. Um, nothing wrong with it, but you, you have to start thinking about issues like support. Is it is it good open source software or bad open source software where you can actually get formal support? Um, some of the risks that are actually quite well, it's the flashing red lights that you, you're getting a situation where your software is out of life cycle. Um, you're not spending enough out of it. Perhaps you have a very old system. There are companies running systems that are 30 years old, perhaps running on, on, on platforms like COBOL. Um, there's questions around um, that. So one, one thing that you need to understand is if you don't spend now, you might need to spend later on, and that's typically true. But every little bit that you're not spending actually adds up, and that becomes technical debt. So if you, in the last five years, haven't spent your desired levels on, on, of 20 mil on, on your software, then you have an issue because you're probably going to have to spend 50 million in, on, in two years, I think five years time. And if you look at the red company, it's likely that they might be playing catch up um, in terms of that. 
very important your shadow IT your shadow IT cost might you might not have actually found the shadow IT cost so there might have been software as a service cost in a business that you're not seeing um, and then maybe you need to go back to your model to actually go see and why why is our software spend so um, so little um, the big important thing is that there is a lack of innovation um, that's also a reason why it might be a little bit um, and that's something to look at in terms of the overspend um, it's not necessarily um, a bad thing it's always good to spend on software because that's something that adds value um, some of the issues and risks that you need to look out for is that the cost, your costs may be denominated in a foreign currency. Um, let's say you have an Azure invoice, a Microsoft invoice, um, might have been SAP, um, some, some, um, some costs that you actually, um, international costs that are denominated in, in a foreign currency. Um, that's actually a, one of the reasons why your costs might be increasing a lot. Um, one of the things that you can actually do there to mitigate the risk is to renegotiate the contract in a local currency. You might also have some inadequate software asset management. So you have lots of extra licenses. You need to improve the game in terms of that. Also, if you look at the third bullet, one of the, one of the um, signs of a failed software implementation project is a big spike in terms of your software spend. Um, you've got to watch out for that. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why, um, why you, you might be uh, showing that kind of pattern. One of the other reasons why you might have a lot of a spike here is your development costs may not have been capitalized. So your developers and your programmers and your IT staff may be spending a lot of time on capital projects, but you expense it straight to the income statement. You might think about capitalizing it and that, that could smooth it out over the useful life cycle of um, of the project or the software that you're developing okay um, one other important thing that i've also seen over the years is that you might have some overlapping technologies so we know that you you might have some technology stacks you might have a stack from uh, computer associates um, you might have an ibm stack uh, depending on how big the company is and how many um, uh, how many actually takeovers and acquisitions there might have been you might have overlapping technologies and then actually put your uh, put your um, your pricing up in terms of your cost um, integration technologies that's actually a good example um, I've seen many different types of integration technologies being used um, sometimes you, you have to ask the question is it really wrong because you're um, if you're using best of breed or, or you're using it in the right situation, you might see a lot of development, uh, sorry, integration technologies in use. Um, but with it comes the licensing costs and then also your um, issues around um, having actually technical support for all of those tools. So that's also something you've got to, got to watch out for. All right, now that you're getting the, the gist of it, um, so if you look at the, uh, the, the, show, the pattern showing in terms of personnel, this company has um, a 40 million benchmark that needs to be spending and is spending about 50 million. Not that bad. Um, it sort of looks okay. Um, things that you need to look out for. Again, the same, same issues as with, uh, with some of the software. Um, you can maybe look at issues like uh, um, if I want to reduce it and it's overspent, um, look at your ratio of permanent to contractor. Um, so um, overseas, the ratio of permanent to contractor is about 80% to 20%. In South Africa, the ratio of contractors are much higher. Um, you might, um, that's, that's just a, a manifestation of, of our economy, I think. Um, so your contractor, if, you, if you've got a situation where you 80% contractors and 20% permanent, then obviously you might be paying too much. Um, it's not a very sustainable model. So look at reducing contract headcount or converting contractors to permanent staff. Um, you might also want to introduce timesheets um, for staff and that could manage um, uh, productivity. 
watch out for issues like um, if you have a lot of personnel costs that means actually that you have a low outsourcing uh, levels you, you have um, you're not using external specialists so watch out for using uh, doing everything internally um, and you have to watch out for issues like um, key man dependencies uh, or key person dependencies um, so if you're doing all of your work internally that's great um, but you might not uh, be agile enough because you don't have access to contractors and also you're not um, actually getting that um, that, that cross-pollination from external people to show you what to do um, on, on some of the more advanced areas. All right, so um, if you are underspending, and we see there's a slight underspend of 30 million that's presenting on the, on the model, um, obviously, you, you, then you need to, to actively start managing key staff dependencies because you are, are um, in a situation where you're underspending and you're putting a lot of pressure on your staff, um, you might need to look at your improving your headcount. Um, also, what, you need to ask the question finally about why is my personal cost so low? Um, maybe there's some shadow IT development. Maybe the business has given up. Um, we, don't, we don't know um, what are the reasons, but it might be that the performance of the IT department is uh, is lacking. And that's why shadow IT development is taking place. So people are actually uh, selecting software as a service um, solutions. Um, and that's actually um, reducing the internal headcount of the, of the IT department. All right, moving right along. And I know it's, uh, it's quite uh, technical stuff, um, but it's still basic. Um, all right, so if we look at outsourcing, um, the, the baseline is that um, the, the, the organization needs to be spending about 25 million out of its 100 million in terms of, um, of its outsourcing spend. Um, this, then we see once we've modeled the model, you know, we've done 80% of the work and now the 20% is about interpreting, interpreting the results, 5 million, and 15 million, that's quite low. So what does that mean? That means that there might be some excessive in-source art service, IT services. You might have a lack of agility, look out for that. Um, because suppliers can make you more agile, you can, you can bring in um, more external resources. Um, I would think you also need to look at your sourcing model. So if you're doing everything in else, can you not get um, better, a better deal outside? Um, what's there's some some questions there maybe you need to do a sourcing strategy in terms of that um granted you might be using um open source software that reduces uh um some 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 costs um you might also have some legacy development um technologies um andre is saying to me there's a question on on the chat um i just need to to get to the chat uh, so there's a question from Jay asking what are the proportions, the percentage spent for companies that are largely cloud driven, like for instance Time Bank which runs its infrastructure largely out of Amazon. Secondly, where do you cater for data spent if you are cloud driven? How is this apportioned in your in your budgeting? So the question about cloud spend, um, there is that's Cloud spend in itself, um, it, it will it will obviously if if you're using software as a service as opposed to um, as opposed to in-house develop or, or let's say packaged um, uh, packaged uh, solutions that are hosted on-prem, um, the cost will still be charged to um, to software. Um, if you're using infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. That'll uh, likely cause a little shift um, from hardware to um, to outsourcing. So, in terms of outsourcing, you um, you go and you um, you 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 add the, the the cost of using an external provider in terms of that. Um, in terms of the total spend of IT, the total spend of IT should actually more or less stay the same. I have a few slides at the at the end talking about cloud a cloud return on investment. Um, 
So this is this is something that you um, if you if if you need to do a business case and you need to compare uh, an on-premise uh, delivery model with a cloud delivery model, um, and then you actually see if there is a benefit. So there might not even be a benefit of going to the cloud, but if as I say it's not um, it's not uh, um, uh, it's 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 the, the the total spend might be the same. Um, but the different buckets are there. Um, what I'll do is I'll, 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 if you can bear with me in terms of that question, um, the slides on the, on, the, on the cloud return on investment is a bit later on, where I actually talk about the different, how your patterns would might change in terms of the types of costs. Um, second question, where do you cater for data spend if you are cloud driven? Um, your data spend is still um, in terms of, it is likely to be on the, on the services which is an outsourcing. Um, so your data spend is um, it's just part of your, your normal network costs. Um, if you, for example, are, have moved to the cloud, you actually need to, um, to, to um, put in redundancy and actually um, increase the bandwidth to the cloud. You might even have your own um, entry point into the cloud um, straight into Europe. If, you, if you're using a Europe-based company like Azure or AWS, but then it's, it's likely to just increase the, the network bandwidth. Um, and that's, that's just regular internet um, bandwidth. So I hope, uh, um, I hope that's okay. Um, so I'll park that for a bit later. I had to do that, um, but I don't really want to jump around in the presentation. All right. Okay, next slide. Um, sorry, I just want to go back. Just if you are overspending, and let's say typically one thing that you need to, to look out for, following on from the previous question, let's say you have Amazon and you have Azure and you have in Google Cloud Platform and you don't have a very good cost uh, regime, cost management regime, um, there's actually no off switch for the cloud. So you have to watch the costs very closely, um, so that you can you can can actually quickly run out of um, out of control. And if you think about a company like Azure, I think Azure you pay in in foreign currency, and then one of the other ones you actually can pay in local currency. Those they are dangerous to that, and they are it's very um, it's something you need to look out for. If you look at, uh, if I go back to this model, let's say you have an overspending um, model, you can actually, you're in a situation where you actually have supply locking um, because you're using a lot, your, your model, your sourcing model is a lot, lies, is, is, is lying a lot more over to external providers. Um, so let's say you have a situation where you actually have 50 million here, then you must be careful about supplier locking and dependency on, on suppliers. Um, you should also think about issues like economies of scale. Um, how good is your procurement function? Are you not paying too much for these suppliers? Should you not um, actually be renegotiating the deals? And then also issues like key supplier dependency. Um, SAP is actually um, a, a company that if you, um, if you actually are wall-to-wall -wall SAP, well, you can never be wall-to-wall -wall SAP, but if you are a big SAP user, you pay a lot for SAP. It's it's a it's a large chunk of your budget, and you also have a, a, a locking in terms of the supplier. So that's actually the first thing I would go do. If I see that you use a lot of outsourcing, I would go down and say, okay, what are the top ten uh, in terms of spend? And then you start seeing which are the which are the ones that you can actually reduce the cost in, and also from a risk perspective, which are the ones that you are locked in, or whether you have some some kind of um, supply risk. Um, if you would be able, if you were to lose them. All right. So moving right along. If you look at the, remember we we sitting with a hundred million in um, in spend, the exact same spend that you would have in terms of hardware, software, personnel, outsourcing. You can also bucket then in a little bit more advanced uh, layer. And and this is also one of those where you. Um, you must actually apportion the, the money. So let's say you have a project. There's a project to replace um, your ERP system. 
um, you go to the business, you ask the business, why are you doing this, this project? Because let's say it's a lot of money. Let's say it is 50 million rands. And the business might say, okay, so we actually, it's a partially a technology refresh. So it's, let's say it's 60% technology refresh, uh, but well, we were also running out of capacity. So 20% of the cost is actually grow. Um, but there's an element where we're getting new capability. So let's say we are able to manage a certain part of the business better and we have a capability, a business capability model and we see the business capabilities needs to mature. But this new ERP system that we're putting in place will be able to do the job and support, um, support that. Then let's say 20% of that, you actually move to the um, abortion to transform speed. So you have 15 mil. Um, you have, if I can do my calculations in my head, um, you have, let's say, roughly um, 30 mil going to run, the run bucket, 20 mil going to the grow bucket, and then, sorry, 10 mil to the grow bucket and 10 mil to the transform bucket. Um, and so what you do is you, you, you actually apportion all of these costs um, to run, grow, transform. A lot of assumptions based, um, but generally um, look at every line item you have on your model. I look at apportion it to run, grow, transform, check with the, the IT people, check with, uh, with the, um, the business if you need to. Um, but generally, run spend is that type of spend that actually um, is there to, um, to run the business, the, to keep the lights on. Um, you have, uh, if you do a technology refresh, that's not grow and transform necessarily, that's likely to be run. Um, don't confuse a move to the cloud as actually being grow and transform spent all the time. It's likely to be run spent because you're actually changing your platform. So if you're not, not in a position to actually um, leverage all of the benefits of moving to the cloud, then you're actually just changing your platform and it's actually run spend. Growth spend is organic growth. So additional capacity, enhancing systems, you might have a technology rollout, um, you might automate some of the business processes, so you're making them more efficient. Um, transform spend, that is the good spend. So that is actually where you add the most value to the business, and that is through, uh, that is promoting business growth. So if you, see, if you see a pattern where you have a lot of transform spend and a, and a little bit less run spend, that's good um, because you want to see most of your, your spend in terms of transform. Um, if you, um, and what we've actually seen over the last probably 10 years or so, you have a, a gradual shift between from run to transform. Uh, so run has become slightly less, transform has been getting a bit more in terms of that. So it was about 10 years ago, it was about 10% of transform spend and now it's about 15%. We see there is a move. Um, obviously, depending on what type of industry you have, um, your transform spend would be much higher. So these are just ballpark estimates, good benchmarks. Um, if you were, let's say you were a technology company and your technology is your product, you never know. You might need to spend 40% of your IT budget on transform spend. Um, so let's look at an example of what can go wrong. If you um, if you forced, and we, we have, a, we have a, a company there, this is the, it's the same company, but this company is a bit under pressure financially. Um, we have a pandemic, and um, let's assume that the pandemic is, is going to last another two years, and there's no choice. We need to cut our ID spending. Uh, so we need to reduce our ID spending by 15%, and the CFO gets called into the CEO's office, and he has no choice. Got to, it's got to move on that. The problem is that the, the, um, the run costs in your budget is usually committed. It's very difficult to, to cut that in a very short time. So your contracts are typically negotiated, let's say for a year or three years. You have maintenance, maintenance costs on software, you have salaries that you need to pay. There's not a lot of, lot of movement that you can actually do. Um, so what, what's the first place that people can actually go cut money in the short term? They can go and they can look at the project portfolio and then they stop all those nice transform uh, projects and that's the wrong thing to do. They, they might cut a few grow um, 
uh, projects because there's so maybe there's a technology rollout, um, there's some system advancements that I can cut. Um, but it's it's actually um, the grow grow areas are actually more visible to the business and then less likely to actually um, cut that. So there is a type of situation where now you've you've done a good job, you've cut your budget to about 85% of the level that it used to be. Um, but see the distribution, the distribution doesn't look right. So if you sustain this model in perpetuity, then you're gonna have an issue. You're gonna, you're gonna, um, you can't, this model isn't sustainable and because you've cut all your transform projects, your business model isn't changing and you might be left behind in terms of your competitors. So over time, try to get back to the model, try to actually reduce your run speed and then uh, improve your growth speed. And if this is the new normal, where you have to operate in less, with less expenses, then um, that's also um, uh, what you need to do. But try to get back to the to the normal ratios and, um, and and recover from that. If we and now let's look at the at the um, at a typical model. So you have you have a, a model where um, you you have this, these are the benchmarks that you need to do, and you can see there's a couple of outliers. So typically you can see run spent here is under a little bit of pressure, and why was that? There was there's, there's been some 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 extra projects, and and it's it's been putting run under pressure. Um, this might be a technology company. They're putting a lot of effort on transform. The run spent going to be in, in under pressure. Don't forget if you have a project, it's very nice for the business to always approve a project based on a, on a budget for year one, and just project cost. Don't forget to budget for future run cost. So if you have a project budget, ensure that it is a five-year budget and it includes the operational cost. Let's see um, some of the other outliers. You might see, this is just maybe a, 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 um, a, a, a sign of being of aggressive business growth. Um, we, let's say maybe if you're a retailer, you're opening a lot of stores, you're going into new countries and so on. Be careful if your transform spend is not enough. Be careful that you might be relegated to a cost center in your organization. So it's very important to actually get good transform spend because you might just become the IT department. Um, and being called the IT department in the company is not a, not a nice thing. Um, so you want to be a partner for the business and you don't want to be relegated to a cost center. Just at a high level, um, Remember, we're still sitting with the same 100 million. You can also apportion it to um, in buckets to um, an IT functional area. So that also gives you a good good idea. Um, what you can see here, just some of the trends, you can see the application development side is quite low. Um, the application support side is very high. So the first question that I'll ask is actually, are you guys um, uh, the victims of a firefighting approach. So you're spending a lot of time keeping your applications running, but you don't spend enough time actually um, uh, leaving room to actually put a new foundation. So look at the ratio of application development to support. It should be almost equal. So that's that's an issue there. Um, data center, you can see here, here we have an issue. This company uh, um, is, is in trouble. It's underfunding um, network costs. Network costs is a bit high, um, look at renegotiating licenses. Um, maybe you've got using a lot of bandwidth. Um, not sure. You need to look at that. It's it's, it's actually quite high in terms of, of baseline. Yeah, you see, service desk is a little bit higher than it should be. Um, look for things like not dealing with the root causes of incidents. Um, then this is an important area that I just like to touch on. Um, IT management. So the IT management component should be about 10%. And IT management includes governance and security as well. The moment I see 5 million here, and it's for 5% in terms of that, I see this an issue. There's, you might be underspending in terms of, um, of, of, uh, of security and governance. So if I look, I'd like, just like to show you a slide. There is a new survey um, out for Isaka, um and if you, I don't know if you're aware that cybersecurity funding over the last five years 
has actually increased 50% to 64% year on year for the last five years. And there's actually no end in sight. So it's actually keeping up at that pace. And if you look at, um, if you look at uh, some of the statistics of a survey that's part of, of that white paper from Misako, um, you can see um, the, the respondents are saying they're either going to keep it remain unchanged, and this is the increase in the budget. The increase in the budget is going to keep uh, change, keep uh, um, increasing, and then or there might be some somewhat of an increase. So the, the pressure is there. The budget is going to keep keep uh, increasing there. So if you if you look at also some of these um, other statistics. You can see that there are still concerns that this looks like almost half of the respondents say so they, they they feel that even though they're spending so much on, on security, they feel that it's still significantly underfunded uh, or somewhat underfunded. So if I go back to um, to this slide, um, watch out for this. Um, if you if your own company isn't spending um, isn't increasing its cyber security budget by let's say fifty percent at least per year then you are not keeping up with, um, with your neighbors and you're going to be in trouble. Um, all right. So, the, so, sorry, so the final, so not the final slide, but um, in, terms of, in terms of answering the question, are we spending it in the right places? That's, I've given you some high level pointers of where to start looking in terms of that, but what, what is enough spend? And in terms of, if you want to ask yourself, um, how much should I actually be spending on, on IT? There, is, there are benchmarks available, and, and one of the best benchmarks is actually IT spend as a percentage of your turnover or your revenue. Um, so let's say, for example, you are a, a, natural, a natural resources, energy company, construction company, um, retailer, and so for example, you're looking at between 1% of turnover, um, or 1.5% of turnover, or even 2 3% 3 of turnover. So your, your companies who, are, who deal in the physical world or who, who work on a basis of tight margins and, and high volumes, they are the ones um, who, who you're expecting to, to have a low percentage. Then again, if you look at your technology companies, and for example, your financial services and banks and so on, they have a very high ratio of IT spend to the, the revenue. So they are up to around 10%. Um, so don't, don't confuse that uh, with transform spend. So that's a total spend. Um, for those companies who are spending up to 10% of their turnover on, on IT, they, um, they might be spending, as we say, up to 40% of that spend on, on transform spend as opposed to run and grow. So that's a good benchmark. So thank you all. Thank your company revenue. That's your consolidated if you have a group. Um, take all your spend, divide it by your turnover, and then you start seeing um, if you are spending. So let's say if you are a company that's running at around 0.5%, and I've seen that um, in, in my career, then you know this you you you're grossly underfunding IT. And even globally, your um, companies like your energy companies, the construction and mining. They're spending at least one percent of turnover. So you need to you need to look at the role of IT in organization um, and, and what's happening there and why why is your company not leveraging um, leveraging technology to its fullest. This formula here is important because the, the spend is not the income statement spend, and I'll leave this to the accountants to figure out. It's a you you, you if you want to do that comparison, it's on a cash flow basis. You use OPEX, you add CAPEX, and you, you take off depreciation. So it's actually in terms of the cash flow that you've spent in a given year. All right. Now I'm coming back to the question um, in terms of cloud computing costs. Um, so I see, I see it a lot where, where the a company is trying to say, Oh, they want to say, okay, so we've got costs now in terms of cloud subscription, Amazon Web Services, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform, or wherever. Um, but look, it's okay that we're spending that because look and see the depreciation in the data center has gone down. Um, and then you're sitting with a situation, it's not a like-for-like -like comparison, 
And the second thing is, even though you have a cloud presence, often you find that um, you also have a, um, a on-premise, a large on-premise um, uh, presence. And, and your depreciation doesn't fall down as much as you actually thought it would fall down. So if you look at some of the costs, if you want to compare um, both sides of the coin, it's very different costs. So data center class typically includes your hardware and software. Um, you might have some services for the data center. You have facilities, you have municipal services, you know, power, water, electricity, um, communications. You need to have skilled personnel in the data center. You need to have disaster recovery. You might, so in other words, you might have to put your own backups in place, your own high availability. Um, and then only you have depreciation as a result of investing in the data center. If you have a cloud platform, the, the actual, the, 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 um, the patterns change a little bit. You have network bandwidth. Um, you might, when you go to the cloud, there's a lot of skills development. You need some consulting. Um, you need to even redesign your processes. So you need to have solid processes for, for Google Cloud, sorry, I mean cloud cost management. Um, you need to take a different monitoring approach. You need to sharpen up your security because now you're sitting your systems in the cloud. Uh, you need to be quite good at um, secure development practices and so on. And when you, when you move applications to the cloud, um, you, you're running migration projects. So it's not as, it's not as easy as that. You need to have good contract management practices because this is actually a vendor and you're actually going to be in, in quite a lot of trouble if you're locked in and you don't have um, portability of your applications. And then only you have um, subscription fees. So that's your monthly consumption based fees. And then so what companies like to do, they, de they try and justify subscription fees at this level with a simple depreciation calculation. So you can see there is a shift um, and in terms of if you have a data center model, there's a little bit of a more cap, uh, sorry, a, a this capex uh, investment, and then you have your typical running cost. Um, cloud costs is a little bit more on consumption based, um, and the, the consumption costs, um, the running costs are actually a bit more. Where your initial investment, like for example, migrating uh, systems to the cloud, is a bit lower. So there's a little bit lower initial investment. All right, so um, this slide, I'm going to leave that to the accountants as well. If you're sitting with a situation, and this follows on to that question that we had earlier about how does the, the pattern change. Um, if you want to compare apples with apples, and let's say you, you, you want to see what cloud, if there is a return on investment on cloud computing, it is a relatively nightmarish um, calculation because you actually have to compare the on-premise situation like for like with the, the cloud situation. And that means what you need to find the in-scope business capabilities. So you need to um, see what is in scope, decide what, it, what is in scope for this ROI calculation. You need to find out and figure out what are the business drivers for moving to the cloud, because that'll give you an idea of some of the tangible and intangible benefits. You need to decide on the right optimal cloud model. It might be a hybrid model, it might be software as a service, it might be actually infrastructure as a service and you host your own applications. So you need to decide what is the right cloud model. So there's not just a straightforward cloud computing model that you choose, you need to um, decide on the right one. Then you actually need to quantify what are the opportunities, and it's very difficult. If you can't quantify them, it creates issues um, later on. Um, and those are, 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 are um, opportunities like agility, scalability, or, or you can actually get the benefit of using new, new technologies. Um, there's some risks as well. You need to quantify those. So in terms of supplier locking, uh, portability. Portability means that you can you bring um, an application or a key system back from the cloud? Can you move it from the cloud to another cloud provider? Those are all issues that you need to think about. So any system is actually portable, but it takes time and money. If you design that in your architecture up front and you put some effort into that, then it gives you, um, gives you some, and then it makes portability easier. 
um, look at the regulatory risk and so on. And everything, all of this needs to, to link up with enterprise risk appetite. So in essence, if you if you want to determine the um, ROI from cloud computing, total cost of ownership is what you're looking at. And you actually, um, you take, uh, you, you first calculate total cost of ownership and then what you take, and this is actually total cost of ownership. You take um, all of the benefits, quantified benefits, tangible and intangible, and you divide, subtract total cost of ownership and you divide that by total cost of ownership and that gives you the return on investment as a percentage. So it's quite a, quite a, a calculation and I, I say it's like me, I haven't seen many companies actually do this. All right. So just a few uh, ending thoughts. Why do we have to spend money on information technology to make business uh, money in business? So this, in a, and we all know it, there's a big focus on technology. Technology is a disruptor. Um, there's a lot of focus on agility and customer experience. Um, we also have uh, technology lifecycle constraints these days. Um, we, we, your products, um, let's say Microsoft, every five years they, they in support, or uh, well, the cycles are with extended support, it might be 10 years, um, but it costs money. So it's, it's, uh, we need to uh, be careful that the cycles don't, we don't get behind, and that's why we need to spend money. Um, there are, the, this is in the Scarpa survey, um, and actually remember the reason why you actually do governance, if you look at COVID, one of the objectives is to actually lower IT costs. Um, so actually by having good governance um, in place, you get better performance and you lower your cost uh, for, the, um, for the company. So by spending actually money on governance, it's actually, there's a lot of benefits um, downstream from there. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about shadow IT. So while there's certainly a risk in shadow IT, um, it also drives um, innovation. So if you look at there's some there's lots of risks. Um, so these are some of the lists, risks that we all know quite well that I've listed. Um, the scary statistic at the moment, if you look at um, at companies like um, research companies like Gartner and um, Forrester and so on and and so on. They estimate that between 30% and 50% of IT spending is not part of corporate IT. So the main corporates are obviously software as a service and then cloud-based products. So you'll be, I've done a lot of internal audits and you, you'll be surprised how many software as a service applications you get in business. And the money gets charged, the, the subscription fees gets charged straight to the business. IT doesn't know about it. IT isn't involved in selecting the supplier because they have no line of sight. Um, business has the purse strings. They're not consulted on security, not consulted on contracts, not consulted on, um, on, on performance and SLAs and so on. And it is quite um, concerning. But um, companies like Gartner are now talking about business managed IT. Um, and so there's no ways about getting away from it. We need to uh, it, it's happening, we need to embrace it, and we need to support um, that in the right way. Um, in other words, so business management IT is here to stay, and I've seen estimates that it might reach about 90% by 2030. So they, there you start asking yourself, so what about the IT department? So will we all be business people, or will we be, I still be IT people, and, and who would be in IT? Um, perhaps just a small core team uh, managing some vendors and external resources. Right, my last slide, and I've, I promise I'm done. Um, if you're in a situation now, you've modeled all these costs and you need to reduce your, your cost, it's not a, it's, there are some quick fixes and there are some long-term fixes. So if you want to, to um, take some actions, take look at the finances, decide what you can do, where you can optimize, and there are some things that you can do short-term and there's some long-term things. So that's actually, um, uh, the long-term things are actually the ones who probably bring you the most benefit, um, but they also take the longest because they actually um, require some change management in, in, in how you operate, in your architecture, in your technologies, your processes, your people, and so on. All right. So, um, do anybody want to um, ask any questions? I'm going to... 
open up chat here. Are there any questions from anyone? Perhaps you can just type it in the chat or you can ask your question. Okay, I'm looking, I'm seeing is anybody, does anybody, you can unmute if you want, if you have a question, you can ask a question. Is there, Arlene is asking if there's a benchmark for project spend, is 1% of turnover reasonable? Um, so, uh, the benchmark for, so I'm going to use an example. Aline works for a financial services organization. Now, I think the insurance, she's an insurance company and their benchmark is roughly 7%. So let's say, but let's say for, for arguments like um, 10, 10 million, the company needs to spend 10%. Um, if you look at the ratio of CapEx to OPEX, CapEx to OPEX ratio is about, um, 70% and 30%. So the ideal ratio is for a, so for a company, a financial services company, they should be spending 3% uh, of their turnover um, on CapEx. Now inside CapEx, you might have projects and you might have some other assets that are being bought. So if your project spent probably, uh, should probably be about two, two thirds of that. So let's say 1% is, is nice, but it should, I would say, your total capex spend and that includes projects should be about three percent of your turnover so you, you you can take any guess maybe one and a half or two percent or so of your turnover should be um should be in terms of um, capex spend um and that's that's more or less the benchmark against global uh, standards um need to be careful of that um i'm saying that you need to be careful about uh, this, the project spend needs to be in the right places. So your best best value for money is still transform spend, laying new foundation. Okay, so I see another question. How would you account for the spend on mobile devices that require apps to be developed and some apps installed? For example, Microsoft Office. So it depends um, if I understand the question uh, correctly. Um, if you, uh, it's just software, you can either like Microsoft Office is subscription based. Um, if it's Office 365 or it's a it's a normal software purchase. If it's a, if it's one of the um, regular uh, uh, the old older versions, they're not um, Office 365. But how I would account for it if you if you need to put it on the apps, you need to it's part of IT spend, um, and it's part it's uh, it, you need to account for it as as regular software spend. Whether it's mobile, doesn't matter, it's just another channel. Okay, any more questions? I think we I think we're probably done. Arlene, do you want to say any closing remarks? Okay. Okay, so there is another question and then it's the last question. So Francois, in an accounting firm, what percentage would constitute reasonable spending for CapEx and OPEX? Um, if I remember correctly, professional services firms are roughly in the middle. So if, if I if I guess it's probably around four percent, four to five percent. So they're a bit more heavily in terms of that. So yeah. So okay, so I think that's all then. And that's uh, that's uh, that's my presentation done. Thank you, everybody. Alini is saying thanks to everybody. She can't unmute, and uh, we appreciate your support for Isaka. Thanks, you, everybody.